This week on Jerusalem Dateline, Israel begins to reopen after weeks in lockdown and Israelis start back to work. Everybody's happy to be here. So I enjoy not only the walk, also to meet the people. Plus, a sobering look at the plight of Middle East Christians. And some good news. The Sea of Galilee is rising after years of drought. And Jerusalem gets a gift of the Lion of the Tribe of Judah from U.S. Christians. All this and more this week on Jerusalem Dateline. Hello and welcome to this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. I'm Chris Mitchell. After weeks of negotiations and more than a year of uncertainty, it appears Israelis will finally have a government and prevent a fourth election. 72 Knesset members endorse Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu to form the next coalition. Netanyahu will continue as Prime Minister for the next year and a half, when he will turn over the top spot to blue and white leader Benny Gantz. The Supreme Court rejected an appeal to prevent Netanyahu from forming the next government. This decision uh, gives expression to the will of a majority of Israelis who knew that Mr. Netanyahu was indicted and nevertheless uh, want him to be able to form the government and to try and uh, clear his name in court uh, simultaneously. It was COVID-19 that helped forge the agreement between Netanyahu and Gantz. And now Israel is taking the next step to deal with the virus, reopening. The Western world is one place that's opening up for everyone, as the country is relaxing restrictions on one of the world's most stringent lockdowns. The decision follows a drop in new COVID-19 cases and includes reopening businesses and schools. CBN Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl brings us the details. Prime Minister Benjamin Netanyahu announced the move, saying Israel had fought the coronavirus well. We've achieved a very big success. One of the most visible symbols affected by the announcement is here at the Western Wall. The holy site is now open for general prayer, but people must pray in designated areas in order to keep the social distancing. Netanyahu also laid out a timetable that would allow Israelis to return to a more normal life by the middle of June. It's permitted to visit your close family members. It's permitted to visit grandpa and grandma. Maybe that's the most important thing, but I'm asking you still, don't hug, don't kiss, and don't touch. In addition to dropping the travel restrictions, the announcement includes immediately opening certain businesses, including libraries, hotels, and nature reserves. Then malls, gyms, and open-air markets were next, and gatherings up to 20 people and weddings up to 50 guests are permitted. Israelis must still wear masks in public and practice social distancing. Children in grades 1 to 3 and 11 and 12 also returned to school this week. The first wave of openings included salons. Salon owner Yaniv Hofi was elated to finally open his doors. It's wonderful. We waited a long, long time to be here and it's fun. It's, it's a bit hard to put all the mask all the time, Yeah. you see, but it's better than nothing. So. Rules for open businesses like salons mean masks, temperature checks, social distancing. Clients also had to answer questions like, do you have a fever or a cough? Were you tested for COVID-19? And if so, what were the results? Manicures involved sticking hands through a plexiglass window that looked like a bank teller. Natalie Cohen had challenges adjusting to her new equipment. It's not easy. I don't have any air. I'm like this from the morning. But I'm okay, praise God. We have work. That's the most important thing. Israel's unemployment has skyrocketed to 26 percent as the economy slowed to a crawl. And after six weeks off, Natalie was glad to be back. It's really fun. I get up early. I was excited. She wasn't the only one. Ten weeks since I've had a haircut, and I am very happy. At last. Yaniv said it's about more than just the business. It's to meet all my uh, amazing clients that I see them uh, daily. And uh, it's fun. Everybody's happy to be here. So I enjoy not only the walk, also to meet the people. Julie Stahl, CBN News, Jerusalem. Well, questions continue to swirl around lockdowns happening throughout the country and around the world. Israeli researchers from Hebrew University have investigated whether these restrictions went too far. And they're offering conclusions 
countries might find useful in the continuing struggle. Perhaps the biggest conclusion from this research is by taking certain measures, many countries would not have needed to close down. The big picture is that in many countries, if you uh, have the population uh, behave in a responsible way, I mean, face masks, hygienic measures, uh, some social distancing, like, uh, you know, one or two meters from each other. Then in this situation, sometimes you can avoid lockdowns. The research data included measuring the number of ICU beds against the larger population. If enough beds remained available for people in the country, research has concluded a total lockdown could be avoided. In some countries where they are, they are, the number of ICU beds per million is not high enough, then sometimes partial quarantine is required to some populations. For example, if you need to quarantine the high-risk population for a certain period, for example, in Israel, the, the need in ICU beds was no more than 60, 70 ICU beds per million. In different countries, it changes by the, the ratio in Israel was that, uh, in fact, there was no need to do a lockdown there. They also take the approach that countries need to closely examine the economic and human consequences of a total lockdown versus the risk of exposing people to the virus. First of all, many people lose their life in the lockdown because of uh, avoiding, like, for example, people in the, the need the chemotherapy therapy, they avoid going to the hospital. And people avoid medical treatment because of the lockdown, but also I think the number of domestic violence and drugs and uh, all these things that will happen as a result of this uh, massive uh, unemployment will cause its toll, and I think it will, the toll will be in uh, human lives. After looking at the total research, these professors feel the chosen cure could ultimately lead to a worse outcome than the sickness itself. Professor Gershon acknowledges the team's conclusion resulted from pouring through several weeks of data after the pandemic began. Still, he adds, their research will be useful for the future. Up next, a sobering look at the plight of Christians in the Middle East. It's tenuous and becoming more so. Uh, it's difficult to look at a situation anywhere in the Middle East where the situation of the Christians is improving. Christians in the Middle East have suffered persecution for centuries, but in the past number of years, this persecution has increased dramatically. We talked with Stephen Rasha. He's the counsel of the Chaldean Archdiocese in Erbil, Iraq, who's written a timely book on this situation called Disappearing People, The Tragic Fate of Christians in the Middle East. Stephen, thanks for joining us here on CBN News. First of all, tell us why you wrote this book. Well, Chris, I was encouraged to write it uh, both by the uh, the people in Iraq uh, that I worked with uh, over this period of time, but also by uh, many of the people in the in the West, in the U.S. Um, that we had spoken with and uh, and testified in front of. They thought the story uh, was important enough uh, that and there was enough to it uh, that it was important that uh, it be put down um, in a contemporaneous fashion uh, in a in a in a situation where Western readers uh, could access it and understand it. So it was really uh, encouraged both by the church and the people in Iraq that I worked with, as well as the people uh, that supported our cause in the U.S. Yeah, uh, how would you describe the situation of uh, Christians here in the in the Middle East? Well, as you well know, Chris, it, it's tenuous and becoming more so. Uh, it, it's difficult to look at a situation anywhere in the Middle East where this situation of the Christians is improving. And that's one of the things we try to uh, get at in the book. It's not uh, completely just about Iraq. We talk about people in the diaspora uh, from the ISIS wars, the Iraqi Christians that had fled and ended up in Turkey and, and Lebanon and other places. We also talk about the situation of Christians uh, in Egypt. Uh, so it's kind of a, a bit uh, across the uh, entire region, although it is mainly focused on Iraq. But uh, I think the situation in Iraq is certainly uh, more acute simply because the numbers have been driven down uh, so drastically. But the uh, the situation across the board uh, is a difficult one, and we, we take that uh, head on in the book. Yeah, you know, the title says a disappearing people. What do you see as the future of Christians here in the Middle East? 
Well, uh, there's there's one of, of two ways to look at it. Either uh, the Christians that are left there now are a remnant group from which a, a rebirth uh, can uh, can begin, uh, provided uh, proper help and changes, quite frankly, in, in behaviors and politics uh, uh, by other groups on the ground. Uh, but the other route that, the, that is possible is that uh, we're looking at uh, uh, the uh, the the end that uh, that this is a slow motion end uh, to nothing left besides a a museum caretaker type people and and you know the situation now in Jerusalem and Bethlehem uh, this is essentially what we're looking at there now and and Iraq is is looking at that situation if the tra- trajectory does not change. Yeah, well, it's a tragic uh, story. What can be done by the church in the West and other places in the world, and also by decision makers uh, in the West as well, to help uh, this disappearing people? Well, by the churches in the West, the most important thing that they can do is to continue to pay attention. There's a real fear amongst the Christians in Iraq that in the current situation worldwide, that their plight will be forgotten. But uh, for them, you know, they're right now in a situation where it's a, a pandemic that came to, came on top of a civil collapse that came on top of a genocide. Um, and it's easy for their plight uh, to get lost um, in, the, in the chaos of everything that's happening both there and around the world. Uh, so they, they really pray and hope that, that people in the West and in the churches uh, in particular will not forget them. And, and hopefully this book uh, can help keep that, uh, that flame alive for them. In terms of the, uh, what governments can do, you know, we have seen a real sea change in the last year or so um, with the current administration on how to deal with these uh, 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 refugee and displaced populations. Uh, there are a lot of positive things that have been happening uh, in this last year, but it's a big, big ship to turn around. Um, the, uh, the institutional uh, aid paradigm is, is something that in many ways is quite broken. Um, and with uh, with help not really affecting uh, the people that uh, you would hope it to. Again, it's another topic that we uh, we go into into in some detail in the book. Yeah. Uh, final question, uh, Stephen. How can uh, people pray for the Christians here in the Middle East? Pray that they keep their courage. You know, the Christians that are left are tough people. You know, and I'm sure you've seen this, Chris, but to pray that they can keep their courage and that they can know that there are Christians in the rest of the world that are in solidarity with them and have not forgotten them. This means a tremendous amount to them. Yeah. Well, Stephen, thanks for uh, really highlighting the plight of Christians here in the Middle East. It's a it's a very important topic uh, for the church around the world to understand. Thank you. Up next. It's the sea where Jesus walked on the water. Find out why people are talking about it once again. Every time I see a full lake, it's like I want to sing, I want to cry out of joy. Well, here's a piece of good news. Over the last few months, an unusually rainy winter nearly filled up the Sea of Galilee. As CBN Middle East correspondent Julie Stahl reports, this is one reason in Israel that rainy winters are considered a blessing. For the first time in 20 years, the Sea of Galilee is nearly full. We are very excited because of this, uh, because of this fact. And um, it's very good for all of us around the lake, the Sea of Galilee, for the agriculture, for the farmers, for the tourists, for everybody. The rise in the Sea of Galilee over the last two years has been remarkable. After five years of drought, it's risen about 18 feet in 2019 and 2020. I'm thrilled. I mean, we still treat it as our lifeline, although we don't drink the water out the sea anymore. And every time I see a full lake, it's like I want to sing, I want to cry out of joy. And I keep amazed by the grace of God. Israel has had more years of drought than rainy years. During the five droughted years, We had a very severe problem with the Sea of Galilee, and we stopped almost completely pumping from the Sea of Galilee. We wanted really to recover the Sea of Galilee as much as possible. The lake used to be one of three of Israel's main sources of drinking water. 
Then years of little rain coupled with growing demand prompted Israel to take other action. Israel is uh, closing the gap with desalination, with recycling water, with conservation, technologies, education, whatever we can. Before last year's rainy season, the shoreline looked like this. It had been dry so long, trees grew along the banks. Now they're underwater. Each year, about a million tourists visit this biblical lake, or Kinneret as it's called in Hebrew, but not this year. Unfortunately, because of the virus, it's empty. And it's this time of the year, we expect it to be filled with many tourists, with many Israelis. Everybody come to have fun in this uh, beautiful, uh, beautiful lake. Even Israelis weren't allowed to visit the shore until restrictions began to be lifted. In March, just before the travel ban, CBN News spoke with a tour guide and a visitor here. It's fantastic. I'm stunned. It's the first time that I came back to the Sea of Galilee since it has risen so far, and I haven't seen it like this in years. It's an amazing privilege to be where Jesus was and to go out, especially on a boat, and watch the sunset over a place that I've read in the scriptures so much about, and then to be able to see it. The lake is currently less than five inches from the red line full marker, but the rainy season is over until next October. And each summer, the water level drops by four to five feet from evaporation. Israelis are already praying for another rainy winter next year and hoping for a return of the tourists to enjoy it. Julie Stahl, CBN News, The Galilee. Still ahead, a larger than life-size Lion of Judah statue a gift from American Evangelical Christians to Jerusalem. We're just very grateful to have a symbol, not just of the strength and the glory of the Jewish people, but a symbol of the friendship of the Evangelical community of the United States, along with the people of Israel and our eternal capital city. Almost 15 years ago, a well-known Christian artist began carving a larger-than-life-size statue for Jerusalem. It depicts the Lion of Judah, and as we'll see, it's taken until now for the artist's gift to be delivered and his dream to be realized. After years of planning and waiting, workmen set Max Greener's Lion of Judah in place. Jerusalem's deputy mayor said the gift sends a message. We're just very grateful to have a symbol, not just of the strength and the glory of the Jewish people, but a symbol of the friendship of the evangelical community of the United States along with the people of Israel and our eternal capital city. The Texas artist completed the sculpture in 2017, but for two years it sat in an Israeli warehouse. Fleur Hassan Nahum heard about the statue from former U.S. Congresswoman and Israel ally Michelle Bachman. She then began to find a home for it, along with help with Rabbi Pesach Wolki. And finally today, the great day has arrived. This is the day the Lord has made. And we, and we finally installed this in the city of Jerusalem. And it's no small thing. Again, this is, this is the city of Jerusalem. This is God's capital city. Thousands of American Christians donated to the project and prayed for its success. To me, this is really, the, you know, this represents where this relationship is going. Um, the fact is today, a big part of the strength of the people of Israel and our security and politically, internationally, is the love and friendship and support of the Christian community of the United States of America. CBN News followed the line along its journey from central Israel to its new home in Jerusalem. It took workmen a couple of hours to set the massive feline in place. Hassan Nahum wanted a special place in the city. The first was that it should be in a park because I really think that this is a beautiful family friendly piece of art, not just to look at, but to take pictures with climb on. Uh, and I thought that it needed to be in a park because it feels more natural in a park than in the middle of a concrete square. And the second criteria, which is very important for me, is that it should have uh, some iconic view of Jerusalem in its background. The nearly 1,200 pound, 11 foot bronze statue will now become a permanent fixture in Jerusalem. It rests here in the new city and overlooks the old city walls. Amos Cohen oversaw the installation in Bloomfield Garden and is responsible for all 174 pieces of art throughout the city. This is the most beautiful of all the pieces of art we have in this city because it is a lion and the symbol of the city of Jerusalem. 
It means more to me than any other piece of art in the city. My heart is filled right now. I love the Christian community. They do so much for the city of Jerusalem and they do so much for the state of Israel. And my heart is with you in friendship. And I thank you. Hassan Nahum says the Lion of Judah symbolizes the history of the Jewish people. We're all uh, part of the tribe of Judah, most of us, but it also means a return uh, to our homeland. And this is what we're doing here. This is why Jerusalem is our eternal capital. Mm. Uh, this is the return of the homeland. And I couldn't think of a better way to express uh, our strength, our glory, the return, and the friendship that we have with the evangelical community in this beautiful piece of art by Max Greiner. Wolicki feels it reflects a scripture from the book of Numbers. It will now be said of Jacob and of Israel, see what God has done. The people rise like a lioness, they rouse themselves like a lion. When you come here to Jerusalem, I'm sure you'll love to see the lion of the tribe of Judah. Well, that's all for this edition of Jerusalem Dateline. Thanks for joining us. Remember to pray for the people affected by the coronavirus pandemic. I'm Chris Mitchell. We'll see you next time on Jerusalem Dateline.